welcome to another edition of The Cutting Edge. My name is Dr. Stephen B. Thomas, and I'm going to be your host tonight for a outstanding live show uh, on The Cutting Edge. Um, we deal with all things health and wellness, COVID and beyond. Uh, the pandemic, believe it or not, while it's no longer the emergency it was, it's still with us. And I know more people today with COVID than I've known throughout the pandemic. It's very interesting. And what a lineup we have for you tonight. Our topic is HIV AIDS out in the open. And we have an outstanding lineup of panelists. I'm going to be introducing you to shortly. And I want you to um, be prepared for a conversation, authentic conversation tonight about another um, infectious disease that when I was growing up as a young assistant professor was the pandemic of my time, the pandemic of my time. What an amazing journey we've been on. And so we're going to be joined by some experts in the field, Carrie, Sierra Carey Brown, Deidre Spears Johnson, and our own Dr. Carol Ritter. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about them later, but let's uh, make sure that you uh, uh, can uh, find us. You see me up here by myself. I don't do this alone, but my friend Omar Neal is in town, and uh, but he won't be able to join us tonight. We'll share it with you a little bit more. But uh, Omar Neal is the former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, and together we have run the cutting edge uh, since our inception. Now, we don't do any of this alone, and our team behind the scenes uh, includes Meg Jordan, our technical director, Sarah Khan, our social media coordinator, and that soundtrack, Elijah Pugh, Elijah Pugh our sound designer. You can catch us on social media platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, threads. We're going to have to add the threads. And we encourage you right now to share this on your social media platforms. And be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Every week, we have an outstanding newsletter that summarizes the work that we've done uh, over the weeks and months. Uh, it gives you up-to-date information on how you can protect yourself and your loved ones from COVID and beyond. Well, I am uh, here running uh, not totally solo because I have my own daily sidekick that helps me run the Center for Health Equity. <laughs> and that's Meg Jordan. Hey, Meg. <laughs> hey, Dr. T. Uh, you know, the mayor's out there. He is in, he's basically uh, nine miles from me right now, downtown Washington, D.C. The mayor is in town for, you ready for this? The 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Can you Not believe that? that? <laughs> Meg, 60 years ago, Martin Luther King made his famous speech. And, and here we are today. And... Um, Do you have the tribute to the mayor? I do. I want the audience to know why the mayor is in town, not only for the anniversary, but he is now being appointed to the board of Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, Omar, uh, this is the organization that Dr. Martin Luther King founded. And Omar Neal is now joining the board, and the board and everyone is in town for that 60th anniversary. So, so let's snap the mayor. Let's snap the mayor up. <laughs> Congratulations, Omar. And uh, over the course of our conversation today, we'll share more information so that when he sees this show, he'll know that we're sending him love and energy. Okay. Closer than uh, he's ever been, Dr. T. He's closer than he's ever been, indeed. <laughs> and and Meg, I'm sitting here recognizing that um, when I started my career, it was uh, HIV/AIDS that was the pandemic. 
Uh, yeah. And it affected a group that was not only stigmatized at the time, the LGBT community, but it's stigmatized to this very day. Now, in 1985, they finally came up with a test for HIV. Now, I'm wondering myself, 1985, where was Meg Jordan in 1985? Where were you, Meg? Not, not born, Dr. T, <laughs> negative 10. <laughs> Not not alive. And so, wow, negative 10. Amazing. <laughs> and that's how time flies. But that means that you were born into a world with HIV AIDS. And as, a, 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 and as a, a young person, relatively speaking, yeah. what does it mean to you today, looking back on that, to this moment? Yeah, you know, it's funny, your career started out with HIV and, and mine started out with COVID. So it, I, I've always found that kind of funny, the parallel of being um, born into a, a young public health practitioner in the middle of pandemic. Yes. Um, but I, I definitely come at HIV from a very different lens um, because when I was, when I was younger um, and I realized I was gay as a young 13 year old, um, I had to ask myself, who am I and who are my people, right? And so, you know, I had no gay family. I had no one other than my friends to teach me what it meant. And so, um, you know me. And so what I did first was I read about it. That's right. I read about it. I went online and I saw, I tried to figure out who my people were. And I immediately found HIV, AIDS, and the pandemic. And... Um, pretty quickly, I, I started to realize that this was my history. You know, lesbians were at the forefront of the HIV epidemic and they were the, the nurses and they were the people who showed up when our, our brothers and our, and our trans sisters were dying so early. Um, and so in this, in this kind of circular way, why do I do public health? And it's because of that, honestly, it comes from but my culture. You know, if, if if we look back, we'll find that the pan, uh, the HIV AIDS pandemic shaped the lives of many people and the careers of many people. Uh, in fact, Dr. Anthony Fauci attributes his work and the growth of his uh, Center for Allergy and Infectious Diseases directly to the pan, uh, HIV AIDS pandemic and to the work that ACT UP I call ACT UP, you know, the, the, like the Black Panther Party of the time, uh, really made him do the right thing. And I think it's an amazing history of how HIV AIDS uh, came into being as a stigma and stigmatizing a group that led to uh, ACT UP, changing the way in which we have access to uh, clinical trials early. They, they demanded access to experimental drugs. Now that's still in place to this very day. And uh, and then the AIDS quilt, uh, which yeah. was another example of how you memorialize uh, uh, those who have been lost. I remember going on the on the mall and seeing the AIDS quilt, and now it's in museums. Uh, and then for COVID, when they did the again on the mall, one million flags representing all that who were lost over a million people uh folks out there listen listening over a million people and when someone tells you it's over and is all behind us don't forget the brothers sisters mothers fathers uncles loved ones who are no longer here today because of COVID, and the same goes for hiv aids you know this show theme was one of the recommendations of our wellness warriors out there, our barbers and stylists. And uh, Andre, uh, if Andre's out there, we're, we're doing the show you wanted us to do, Andre, out there in Atlanta. And let's set the stage, Meg. Let's, let's set the table uh, yeah. to take people back so they can remember where we were, where we are now, and what lessons from the HIV AIDS pandemic we can move forward. Our theme, HIV out in the open. We're going to take you to the front line before we introduce our guests. Meg, take it away. Today in America, 
152 people will become infected with HIV. Half of them will be black. First five patients were white. The next two were black. But in our reports, we said nothing whatsoever about race. It really is an omission on our part. We thought about AIDS as affecting only white people and then only white gay people. There were no black gay people. You don't tell other folks how poor you are. You don't tell other folks that you can't pay the rent. And you certainly don't tell other folks that someone in the family has AIDS. Ignorance makes you more susceptible to the virus. I'm from the South. People don't talk about sex, let alone talk about HIV. Being a bornie, being born with HIV is a lot. I was the last one born in my family, and I was the only one born with HIV. Magic, magic in the front court, dribble drive underneath. Magic Johnson goes public, and it was absolutely extraordinary. It wasn't just that he was a basketball legend. He was John Blackman next door. But remember, no one wanted to be on a basketball court with Magic Johnson. I'm not cured. I've been taking my meds. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm living with this virus in my blood system and in my body. The sad part is we have people that die alone as a result of somebody being afraid to touch them. AIDS is God's curse to a homosexual life. I think it stinks in the nostrils of God. He doesn't get that God loves all his children. How could you love me and keep such a secret from me? This is the worst kind of betrayal. This is not love. We've been at this for 30 years, and we need to be talking about endgame. Ending the epidemic is entirely within our power. How many of your sons, your daughters, your sisters have to die before this is about us? Endgame. Age in Black America. Coming July 10th to Frontline. Wow. We'll drop that link to the show in our chat for you. And so we've now set the stage for our conversation tonight. So Meg, let's bring up our first guest. I'm so excited to introduce you to um, our first panelist, Sierra Carey Brown. She's Community Outreach and Education Coordinator, dedicated to public health advocacy with an MPH degree, and that's a master's in public health and epidemiology from Morgan State University, right here in the great state of Maryland, the great city of Baltimore. <laughs> and she has also degrees from Towson University, which is also here in Maryland brings a well-rounded educational background over five years at the Institute for Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. And most importantly, uh, uh, she uh, is a certified health education specialist. That's my field. I'm so excited to have a C-H-E-S on the show tonight. Hey, Sierra Carey Brown, welcome to The Cutting Edge. <laughs> Hello, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Well, Sierra, uh, take a moment and tell this audience out here, you're talking to a national audience um, <laughs> about this topic. Tell us a little bit about how did you get involved in this work? Okay. Well, first I wanna make a correction. I'm, I'm still currently a student um, at Morgan, um, getting my master's in public health. Okay, we snapped okay. that. We thank snapped you, that all you. around. That's how we do it. <laughs> Um, I will say my beginning was um, my experience as a track and field coach, actually, at a high school in Baltimore, where I realized that um, not only the high school where I was coaching, but also just around the city that a lot of students weren't really i don't know if it, if it was that they were not engaged in sexual health education or they weren't really receiving 
proper sexual health education, whatever it was, the children need help. <laughs> and as a coach, I was sitting around the children, listening to them make jokes and everything, you know, not really saying anything, let, letting them, allowing them their space. And I heard the conversation about so many things, but the one thing that struck me was about women who had went through menopause being able to have um, to conceive. And it started a conversation about the sex education that they were receiving. And they were like, oh, we know STDs, pictures, pictures, pictures. That's all we know. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is a problem. And that really honestly got me started. I wanted to do health education i wanted to spread the word health promotion about sex and then i began to look look into sex and stds and hiv but then i realized there was another portion there's sexual pleasure then i started sexual what P pleasure oh, oh sexual pleasure then i began to understand how sexual pleasure actually is a social determinant of health wow I, yeah and then i just was I came into the HIV field as an intern, actually, while I was at Towson um, for the Jocks Initiative, where I am currently employed. And I, th this has been my space for the past five years. I love wow. it. I enjoy it. And it really and truly and honestly touching the youth um, really keeps me going. Now, say a little bit about the Jocks Initiative. Yes, yeah, so the Jackson Initiative is a program um, in the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, it is, has been around since 2003, named after Joe Jacks, who was a psychotherapist in Baltimore, and I believe the, the first one to host um, a group for those who are HIV positive. Wow. Yes, and we still actually continue that group. I, I believe it happens. I believe it happens monthly, but we still do continue that group. But mostly, my responsibility um, and and my coworkers' responsibility is that we do outreach, we do education at colleges, universities, out on the street. We go into clinics. We go basically anywhere anyone will have us. We okay. go and we talk about HIV prevention, and we also provide point of care testing. So that mean no needles, people. No needles, just the mouth swab. That's the thing most people are concerned about always: is is it a needle? There's no blood draw. It's just a mouth swab. Um, and so we go out in the community, we educate not only about HIV, I said HIV prevention, so there is the PrEP and the PEP and the proper use of prophylaxis, all, all the good things. Wow. Yes. You know, I'm thinking back at the time when we had the uh, grassroots organizations getting involved in meeting the needs of that community, addressing issues of stigma. And one of the programs that just sticks in my mind just because of the way they named themselves, they delivered food mm -hmm. to people who had HIV and could not get out. And they called themselves God's Love We Deliver. Mm -hmm. There's just such amazing creativity that came and is still coming. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that HIV AIDS is totally preventable. And so when you're out there with these young people, you just heard Meg say when she was when we when we came up with the test for HIV AIDS in 1985, she was 10. She wasn't even born. It was 10 years later than she was born. Now, so the young people you're working with out there now have been in a world where this has been around the, the information about preventions around. Uh, but issues of reaching people where they are with communication channels that they use and trust. It's still a challenge. So what are you finding on the streets? Like you said, the stigma is still, it's just a nasty bug that we can, it, it just, it's very hard to squash. The stigma is still exists. I believe because, um, because of the medication, because of the prevention um, efforts, which have been success successful, there have not been many AIDS diagnosis. Um, and so people are not hearing about it as much. 
And of course, we know out of sight, out of mind. And so because people are not, quote unquote, seeing it and hearing it, they're no longer thinking about it. But when they do think about it, it seems that they're thinking about the 90s. And so like it's terrible. I, some people are still thinking that you can um, transmit HIV through saliva. Some people are still thinking that you can transmit HIV by sitting on a toilet. Um, so it's kind of... <laughs> Wow. It's up in the air. It's either I'm, I haven't heard of it because the prevention efforts are, are going so well. But then when I do hear about it, it's just total um, it, this misinformation but is, and it's based on the stigma. I am so glad that the Jocks campaign is out there continuing to educate our community, because if we were to look at that pie chart right now, a lot of those new cases are people of color. Absolutely. So we got to reach our folk in places they trust, uh, through influencers they trust, and, and and we believe that can be in our barbershops and beauty salons. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, you're going to be joined by uh, another panelist. Uh, let's get this show started. Our next panelist this evening is Deidre Spears Johnson. She is the co-founder of Heart to Hand. Deidre is a dedicated healthcare leader uh, with a commitment to health and wellness. Uh, she holds a Master of Science degree in Health Services Administration from Central Michigan University. And um, for uh, the past 20 years, uh, her work in heart to hand uh, has addressed some of these critical gaps in sexual health care. It's amazing that here we are still nervous about talking about sex <laughs> yeah. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we can do that right here uh because it's a conversation that happens in the barbershops and salons hey Deidre Spears Johnson welcome to the cutting edge hey good evening how are you it's, it's just fabulous to have you on with us and Thank you so much. Uh, take a moment we read your uh background tell us something we don't know from that professional background about you and what motivates you? Well, um, I, I would say that my life's work is serving the community and I would describe myself as a um, servant leader in all aspects of my life. And um, I come from um, the South, a small town in Georgia, and um, I'm the daughter of Ruby of Joyce Spears and the granddaughter of Ruby Johnson. And all of that comes from them. Service comes from my family, comes from what we've done from the beginning of time, even before I knew what I was doing or even before I I enjoyed it, enjoyed it. It was just a part of what we did in the community. We served. Wow. And what service does Heart to Hand deliver? Um, Heart to Hand was started 25 plus years ago by my best friend Sally Joseph and I, and we started out as a small community based organization. Literally, we started at the kitchen table and so i'll take you through our history and can describe this, the services that we um, provide we listen to the community. And the services came out of those conversations, and so we started with community outreach literally with passing out brochures and flyers and pamphlets. So that's our community outreach program. We still do that program today. Um, um, I put a wrap around my vehicle that said heart to hand. And I think wow. my husband, my husband, who also is a barber, I think I told you, <laughs> thought, I was thought I was crazy, you know. Not but, the barbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, just, you know, I, it's it's been our whole, it's been my entire life in terms of trying to provide information to the community and so the community said we now need we need help to understand the community um health system and so now we provide navigation we started providing um health non-medical case management services where we would help people to understand how the health system works because it's very complex you can have insurance you cannot have insurance but either way you still need service and so we wanted to help people engage in the system 
with where they were. So we help them figure out like what is available to you based on your current situation. And that's our non-medical case management system. And so then they're like, oh, now um, I'm, some folks were HIV positive, and so they needed medical case management. Yes. What that service entailed was we need someone to support us through this process because of the stigma that we talked about earlier, because of the fact that they haven't disclosed to their family, because they don't know where to turn, to turn. Heart to hand medical case management component is the, uh, we end up being the family. We started to be the family for those HIV positive people. Um, the organization started in 1999. Um, so we've had clients from 1999 moving forward. Wow. So we became their family, they become a part of us. And so for the non-medical case management services, we provide referrals, we provide food, we provide transportation, we provide health insurance information, we provide just information and understanding about your disease. How do you, how do you, how do you remain healthy? And there's so much information out there and things have changed so much. And we also, just a few years ago, we were so grateful to be able to, to have a medical practice. And so listening to the clients, the services that they were receiving were still, they were still engaged in stigma. You know, even with service providers, they were not um, comfortable going to those service providers and telling them that they were HIV positive. So we wanted to bring more services where they were already comfortable. So we were able to create a medical practice where we have a full-time infectious disease provider who takes care of those individuals who are living with HIV. They're able to come to get their medications. We have a pharmacy within our location. They're able to come to see the doctor, get their medications, get their um, medical case management um, as well. Um, additionally, we, we provide psychosocial support services, which includes um, mental health services, support groups. So you're able to talk to people who are new to HIV and they're just getting their diagnosis, but you're able to talk to people that, that have had HIV for 25 years wow. and they're living well. Living so you, well. Can see, you can see that um, as, you know, I've, I've started 30 years ago with the Centers for Disease Control telling people that they were HIV positive, yes. but not really being able to give them um, and for giving, giving them hope. You know, I wanted to give them more hope, but fast forward, I'm working with people that are living well, 30 years into it, able to talk to individuals who are newly diagnosed. Um, back in the day, they were taking 30 pills, 25 pills, and today they're taking one pill. And even now our clients are taking an injectable um, treatment every other month. Wow. So things have changed a lot and the organization has grown with the change so that we can help people live well. In addition to the HIV um, treatment and care, we also provide um, treatment for people who are um, diagnosed with STI, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. You can get um, treatment screening for those infections as well. The difference with, with Heart to Hand is that we provide low cost as well as free. Um, we are grant funded um, through the Ryan White program. And we can talk about that if you want to. Also, we have a CDC grant, one of the only, only organizations in Maryland to have the CDC grant to, to provide low cost or free STI treatment and care. Well, I just want to applaud you Thank for you. stepping up, creating the organization, heart to hand. You heard me say that one of the programs that stuck in my head was God's Love We Deliver, uh, instrumental uh, human care, uh, loving care for those who had been ostracized and, and shut out. Uh, you, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring up our, our final panelists, and then I want you all to be thinking about what you saw in that trailer, because that took us back back to the day. Uh, so be thinking about that as I bring up our third panelist, uh, Dr. Carol Ritter. And so um, uh, Dr. Ritter has been with us uh, from the beginning of our work in this pandemic. She represents <laughs> the, the uh, Maryland State Medical Society and helps us bring in clinicians and others into uh, this space. But she is a, a, a MD gynecologist. And so I can only imagine what comes through your practice, Dr. Ritter. Welcome to, welcome to the cutting edge as a panelist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be a panelist and be able to be on here with such wonderful people doing such amazing work. I'm totally impressed by the two of you up here, and I am looking forward to learning more because I haven't kept up to date as much as I should with this, particularly with this 
pandemic that we've had. And I, like Dr. Thomas, started my career with the HIV pandemic. I was a medical student in 1980, in the 1980s. And then I went through residency as an OBGYN. So I remember this strange virus coming into our world. I remember it being a gay man's thing. I didn't have to worry about it. I'm an OBGYN, <laughs> right? And then we started seeing the babies in the NICU. And everyone was like, what is this? Oh my goodness. Can you imagine then the babies that were left behind in the <clears throat> hospitals? You know, that stayed there sometimes for a year, a year, because there was no place for them because of the stigma. And I thought to myself, how in the world it must have been so much fear and pain for a parent to have to do that. And I just, you know, it was, it was fear and it was blame that uh and then of course women and children are always like left behind right because we didn't get paid attention to until i mean they didn't even start giving drugs to pregnant women with hiv or tell us how risk reduction to you know not breastfeed those kind of things for over a decade after the virus was identified over a decade we suffered with the misinformation and the in and just ig ignorance you know but i don't know this pandemic has been uh, repetitive in some ways of our messaging with blame and shame with covid i mean you think we would have learned our lesson it's better better with basically harm reduction i mean they found that during hiv didn't they where we started doing harm reduction with condoms and universal precautions at the hospital and and then opt out uh testing instead of opting in i mean we learned all that with hiv and it seems like a lot of it we've just forgotten with covid second you know, pandemic in my life and and mine as well and as you're talking it's like triggering things for me and for that audience out there it may be triggering and so it's good to know that that um deidre and sierra are out there right now with our young people, helping them uh, protect themselves, uh, helping case manage people. I remember when those folks were taking those 25 pills a day, and now what you just described is actually quite remarkable. Uh, even the TV commercials that I see uh, are quite remarkable. Uh, I used to stop them, and, and I used to literally pause it and record it because it was just so unusual to see same-sex couples being themselves in a TV commercial for a medication. So even, even with that, though, if, if I might add, it, I, I agree with you that it's amazing to see it. It's great that they're getting the information out there. But even that has what, I've, what we've noticed in the field and what community members have, have been saying is that even that can be stigmatizing, though. Really? Yes, because a lot of them, they're, they're not only promoting HIV medication, but as I mentioned before, they're promoting PrEP. And so if, if I'm a person who is unaware, I don't know anything about public health, um, not really much about the medical field. I hate going to the hospitals. It makes me nervous. And I see this commercial constantly with only gay people, um, with only um those of trans experience then you're not really speak who are you speaking to you're not speaking to me and so <laughs> i don't even know this medication exists or if i know the medication exists i don't think it's for me and so it it kind of reinforces the stigma that began in the 80s that this is a gay man's disease or a gay man's infection well, yeah. I, can, I just, can I just jump in really quickly? I really agree with what she just said. And I think that that is why at heart to hand with our CDC project, we chose to work with the heterosexual community because um, 
in order to end, and there's the end the ending the epi HIV epidemic funding through the federal government that's really trying to, to push different areas in the comp in the country to be able to um, focus on those communities that have not been um, not been educated and create awareness about. And so you, we talk a lot about the LGBT community, but if you look at Maryland, the epidemic in Maryland is almost 50%, um, the, the incidence rates, almost 50% heterosexual and homosexual. So I think that's, a, that's what we, we really need to talk about, the fact that we focused on the LGBT community, but the heterosexual community is, as, is at risk, but has sort of been ignored in this fight. And so we're really trying to create awareness, education. We're trying to bring our um, um, a heterosexual community into understanding, particularly Black women. And Heart to Hand was founded particularly because Black women were being affected. But because where we're situated regionally, we've had to open up to everybody because there's not that many services in Prince George's County for HIV or sexual health. And we're expanding it to sexual health. So I really agree with that and want to really um, um, push that, that the heterosexual heterosexual communities really need to understand that they we are aware we are we are um at risk because we don't know because we and then also people who are aging um coming single again there's viagra people are you know we're healthier we're having fun you, you know, know we're less likely to use condoms than anybody so what you know you uh, and, and Doctor, I know you have a thought. Hold the thought just for a moment, because we're talking about basic education and the need to keep people up to date. And and y'all have thrown down some knowledge we need to break down. So uh, here's a couple of them, and you can decide who takes it. What is harm reduction? Uh, what is prep? Let's break it down for the people. What is prep? And why are black women getting HIV? So let's start with the first one. What is harm reduction? I can, I, uh, Dr. <laughs> well, basically, like with, with uh, harm reduction in general is like, OK, you wash your hands so you don't spread things, right? It's the uh, activities that you can do to reduce your your risks. Um, I think harm harm reduction is um, in the COVID was like uh, social distancing and uh, wearing a mask. Uh, things that you can do, actions that you can do to keep yourself safe without being, you know, abstinent or quarantined because you have you have to you have to sustain this safety in your world. So that's the way I look at harm reduction. And I'm sure, you know, the other two have <laughs> your ways of looking at it, <laughs> probably well, from more of a scientific point of view. But well, it, it is the basic things you mentioned. And what's, what strikes me is that uh, in the HIV uh, case, one of the ways that people were being infected was through intravenous drug use and sharing of needles. Uh, and I was there at the very beginning of the needle exchange work, and that was illegal, uh, Doctor. You could go to jail for that. And we knew that it was a way of spreading HIV. And then the concept of harm reduction came in to say, this is about reducing harm, not criminalizing individuals. So isn't it interesting that that uh, at the beginning in the HIV era, it was harm reduction to be able to promote what worked like needle exchange. Mm -hmm. And here we are with the COVID harm reduction in certain places they want to outlaw you being able to mandate a mask, mm -hmm. uh, prevent you from having quarantines uh, to protect people. Or give you a stigma. So we, we have been here before uh harm reduction you're hearing it now even in the opiate and the fentanyl giving people a way to measure whether or not their drug whatever they might be taking is contaminated with fentanyl that would have been that's illegal in some places sure. but it's a form of harm reduction so it's a it's a, a method that we owe to the hiv aids uh, movement can I just quickly say that um, Heart to Hand does have fentanyl testing strips. Nice. So if anyone would need a fentanyl testing strip or a Narcan kit, they can come and um, come to Heart to Hand and get one for free. And we'll also give training as well. That is amazing. We'll, we'll follow up on that because we're going to have some of the barbers and stylists come in and talk to you. Uh, my next quiz question, what is prep? <laughs> what's what's <laughs> prep? <laughs> I'll take that one. 
So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Oh um, my God. <laughs> mouth <laughs> pre exposure <laughs> prophylaxis. To really, really simplify it, what we say out in the community is that it is HIV prevention's version of the birth control pill. Wow. This is what we say to, so that people can understand it. It is for those who are HIV negative. And we really have to stress this because sometimes people are not really understanding. You have to be negative to take this medication. But what it does, it is it protects you it prevents you from becoming hiv positive from the um from hiv transmission that is an amazing breakthrough so my question to you sierra you say it's like a birth control pill but is it could it be like the morning after pill so the morning after pill in the in hiv prevention world we use pep which i did explain before but that is the post exposure prophylaxis so pre-exposure wow. is i'm preparing myself because maybe i have multiple partners maybe i'm a sex worker and maybe i don't know the status of the person i'm having sex with maybe i'm faithful but my boyfriend girlfriend husband wife partner is not faithful maybe i'm in a polyamorous relationship maybe i just whatever the case is i'm preparing myself ahead of time so that i can lower the risk of hiv prevention 99 percent wow now post exposure prophylaxis which is the morning after pill is the medication that one receives after they've had a possible exposure possible because we don't know it's the same medication that clinicians take if they get a stick so any doctor any nurse who is in the hospital if they've had an accidental stick they don't know the status of the patient maybe the patient doesn't want to get tested they automatically take the medication you have three days three days to take the medication so if i went out friday and i went out for a party maybe i was sexually assaulted maybe i had too much to drink and i'm not exactly sure if i had sex or maybe i know i had sex but my partner is gone the person i had sex with is gone i'll probably never see them again i have three days i have until monday to get this post exposure prophylaxis that is pep prep and pep well you know you've educated me tonight because that those are lifesavers and, and to know that deidre is out there helping navigate people through the healthcare system to get it yeah. and dr ritter's there with patients coming into her practice that may come in with a little bit of fear about uh, their exposure and being able to talk to them about these options uh why are black women getting infected with HIV in 2023, given all that we know? This is a complex question. Um, from my 30 years experience working in HIV, what, one of the things I do know is Black women want to be with Black men, right? So there are many reasons. Some of our Black men are going, they, they're uh, in the penal system and they, they come back Maybe they've had um, situations in jail that maybe they didn't want sexually, and maybe they get HIV in jail. They come they come out and they may not tell their partner. It's all it, it all goes back to stigma, really. Some people are on the down low, meaning that our community is so so um, it's so stigmatizing to be bisexual or gay that people don't tell their partners that they have these experiences. There's so many, and the the larger larger issues is that in our black community we don't talk about sex period what what <laughs> we don't like we don't we we have babies you know we have you know we multiply but we don't know where that comes from we don't talk about sex we you know we don't educate our adolescent kids as they grow up that actually it's a natural process your body's going to start changing you're going to get these feelings we want we don't empower them to make those decisions about their body bodies. Sometimes black women, they find themselves in situations where they can't talk about it 
based on domestic violence. Um, that you know you're losing control because if you talk to your partner about using a condom in our community as Black women, people say you're loose, you're fast, all these different things um, about what you are. So it's 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 about stigma. It's about the lack of knowledge. It's about fear. All these things layered upon layered. It's about ne not necessarily putting ourselves first as Black women. We're taking care of our mother. We're taking care of our children. We're taking care of our husbands, our partners, our cousins, whoever, we're taking care of the community, but we don't always take care of ourselves. So it's so many different things that um, that allow Black women to be infected. But another big thing is that we live in areas where our HIV rates are high. Okay, and geography matters. And geography matters. All of there, it's just, it's, it's those um, inter, those social determinants that also cause us to be at risk. The intersectionality of it all. Well, you guys are putting out all these big words, intersectionality. <laughs> <laughs> Let's break that down. Uh, what do you mean when you talk about intersectionality? Where you live, where you work, how much money you have, who you, who your partner is, all those things, Matt, they cross over and they create this story that tells this, that, that um, puts you in good situations and it puts you in bad situations. Hey, oh. To, to break it down and make it simple. Well, you know, I, I want you to I'll, uh, take a moment here. Uh, one of the things we do in the show is to kind of get a pulse beat of the audience out in the world listening to us. And and we simply ask you to think of a word, Sierra. Uh, think of a word, uh, Dr. Ritter. Think of a word, Deidre, right now that best reflects how you're feeling at this moment in a pandemic. It's not the emergency that it was. Uh, WHO has declared it's no longer the global emergency, but we all know it's still here. Think of that word and drop it into the chat. And for the next 60 seconds, drop as many words as you can think of into the chat. And for our people out there in social media land, uh, you can use the Q&A box and just drop those words in and our crew behind the scenes is going to build a cloud. Uh, and the more people who say a word, the larger that word will be. So just drop those words in. And um, uh, Meg's back there multitasking. And so I'm going to have her bring up uh, Sharon Cooper, uh, and Dorothy, and Andre. You're going to be on deck, so get ready. But bring up Dr. Sharon Cooper. And uh, hey, Sharon, welcome to The Cutting Hello. Edge. Hello. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> You know, you've been with us from the very beginning of our efforts around COVID. And then we went to COVID and beyond. And here we are with our topic today on HIV AIDS. Now, I don't want to ask where you were in the 1980s, uh, uh, but I think you were in the world with us. You know, well, I certainly was. <laughs> I certainly was. Yeah, I mean, this is really enlightening. So just take a little thumbnail about who you are uh, for our guests. Good evening. I am Sharon Gibbs Cooper. I am an employee with the University of Maryland Institute for Governmental Service and Research. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Stephen Thomas, and I have had the privilege and honor of working with some of the uh, uh, wellness warriors in their efforts in educating, uh, promoting health, and saving lives in the community. So it has just been, again, a privilege and an honor. I want Deidre and, and Sierra to know something that Dr. Ritter knows already, and that is that uh, Dr. Sharon Cooper uh, really helped us get our barbers and stylists certified as community health workers in the state of Maryland. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, that's, great. that's right. That's right. Yeah. We snapped that all the time <laughs> yeah. because uh, we were doing that before the pandemic, yeah. and then the pandemic hit. And now we have barbershops and salons where we have certified community health workers who've transformed their shops into COVID vaccine sites. That's and great. you're going you're gonna to meet them uh, tonight, uh, Deidre and, and uh, Sierra, and talk about listening to what they're hearing in their chairs when it comes not only to HIV AIDS, but sexual health in general. And I'm really interested in, in um, women's health. You know, Dr. Ritter has come on this show and said her, her campaign is zero maternal mortality. Why are black women dying in childbirth? I ask you, why are they 
developing HIV AIDS. These are all issues on the table tonight. And how can the men in their lives, okay, help them and be more informed? You came on tonight using that word men uh, pause. <laughs> now, I know some of you on the show right here in the screens know what that is. There's a whole lot of brothers out there. A whole lot of brothers out there have no idea. I have no idea what men up on. <laughs> Andre, hold on. You coming up soon. Hold on. So let, let me do this, Meg. If if um, I know you're multitasking, uh, and Sharon, you can stay up here with us. Uh, let's bring up uh, Mike Brown. Uh, Dynamite Brown. Let's get a brother up in here. Uh, Dynamite Brown is one of our original uh uh, HAIR, which stands for Health Advocates in Reach and Research, part of our national network. And he was our first uh, barber here in the state of Maryland that we built the program around. Hey, Dynamite Brown, how you doing? Hey, Dr. T, how's everybody doing? <laughs> hey, listen, I know you're happy and sad. Today, he, he dropped his son off to college today. <laughs> he drove his son to college. And it's been just wonderful watching those boys grow up. Hey, Mike, congratulations. You've done your job. Now, now you're letting them fly the nest. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I think it was my job to get them to the runway. Now it's just time to run down the, 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 the runway and spread his wings and go on the fly. <laughs> and so you have to keep him safe. you got to protect him. He's now out there, not under your uh, uh, watchful eye. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and these, these risks are out there from COVID to, to HIV. So Mike, what, what what are you thinking about uh, the trailer, the movie that we just put up, takes you back to the 80s, and what does it mean for you today? Um, now, obviously, this is really a touchy situation for me. Um, you know, things and dealing in this uh, magnitude of conversation uh, is really touchy. So you really have to be careful in, in, in how you, uh, express your uh, stance on the concern that we're talking about. Um, for me, you know, um, I did a lot of preventive maintenance on my son. I dropped him off at college um, and we were walking through the campus and the, the young girls were just, it was, it turned the head. So, you know, I'm, I'm taking this stuff in, you know, and I, I can tell his mom, but, you know, one of the, one of the packages I had for him were full of condoms. You know, you have to protect yourself. Um, I, I definitely wanted him to do that. I, I know what goes on on college campuses. Uh, he's away from home. You know, I know that you can get, uh, you know, a little bit of the dog off the chain syndrome. And, you know, so I, I wanted him to protect us. So we had a long talk. Um, I'm confident in where he's going um, and what he's going to do. Uh, however, back to the comment, I don't want to stay off the conversation, but um, when we talked about the uh, the people who are um, on the down low, you know, that really is a bone to pick with me. You know, I don't have a problem with the lifestyle that you choose for 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 your life. I, I'm gonna love the person anyway. I don't have to agree with your lifestyle. I'm not gonna judge you or anything. However, but the the down low individuals to me, they play a double standard. You know. And when you do that, you bring back risk to the community. And that's how it's spread it because you don't want to be real with who you are. And then you go and you contaminate and affect other lives. You don't understand the magnitude of devastation that happens to other families. It happened to me, and this is personal for me because it happened to my little cousin in Pittsburgh. Got with a down old guy, gave her the stuff, and it, she succumbed to AIDS. So this is a very personal topic to me, you know, if 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 you feel that, you know, you want to you don't want to be a man anymore or, or whatever, then be open with it and, and, and stay in your lane. Don't be playing both sides of the fence and these type of things happen. And it caused me a heterosexual man to, you know, feel some type of way. And it's not about the culture or your lifestyle. It's about how. Uh, you just had no respect for any other persons involved and you just reacted in this way. And it, it really strikes, it picks a bone with me. It really kind of irritates me. Um, this is a sensitive topic for me because it's a personal loss involved. Um, 
I don't have any um, ill feelings towards anyone, but that specific category, those down low guys, you know, I just be who you are, you know. And and so, uh, Sierra or Deidre, I know you mentioned this, and, and it's about the stigma. Uh, talk to Mike. Can I make, I just, I mean, it is, a, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because um, it's the only way we're going to get to collaboration and understanding. And so um, I kind of want to just make a, not a correction, but a, a, a statement around his language. And just because people in our community, we say things um, just because, you know, it's how we talk. So he said, if the person doesn't want to be a man anymore, then he should tell somebody. I just kind of wanted to make a statement to say that um, I don't know if you were speaking about if it's a gay man or not, but a person that's gay doesn't necessarily not want to be a man. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn in terms of what your thought was, but I just wanted to say that just so that we can even open that conversation up. It's a touchy situation. Um, it, it's stigma. Um, it's it's um, so many things. And I think a lot of times people think that people don't want to come out and they don't want to uh, be who they are, but it's complex because our community does not accept that. And so if you're a person that is um, bisexual or gay or non-binary, it's very difficult for you to come out to a hostile community. So I think that, yes, the person has a personal responsibility to, to do that and to be, be truthful, but our community can do a better job of helping people to disclose and open up. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, is that there are people who are heterosexual are heterosexual who are having multiple partners and exposing individuals also to HIV. So it's not necessarily just those people who are on the down low. So it's it's a complex, complex situation that as a community, we really need to dig into it. And, and I'm so glad we're having this conversation. May I just say something? Um, again, I would like to applaud everyone on the panel for all the work that they were doing. Um, back in the day in the 80s, uh, I served on the uh, Orange County, California HIV Advisory Council, in which they were looking at diversity, how to uh, provide services for not only the infected, but affected community. And back then it was so innovative uh, with the American um, Red Cross, they even offered uh, HIV training for uh, individuals to go into the churches, especially in African American communities, because again, the stigma was so great at that particular time that individuals uh, it prevented them from going in for testing. And part of that, what I did was not only working in women's health, but advocacy for HIV. Um, I was uh, able through grants through Ryan White and other programs. Uh, to implement HIV testing programs and going through educating folks about, okay, not only coming in for the test, but understanding what the behaviors are. And I think it's so important with what you all are doing as far as educating folks, getting them connected to those services, and also looking at the whole uh, broad scope of how families are affected and making sure that those case management, health, and that whole realm of services are accessible for individuals early, frequently, often, and filling in those gaps. So uh, again, it's been so much work done since I've worked in that capacity uh, on the advisory board for Orange County and California AIDS Association of AIDS agencies. But the work that you've done, all of you, it's been, uh, I applaud you all and I thank you all. And you, you can hear the pain. Uh, you can hear the fact that uh, people are still getting infected. Yeah. And, and you get angry when you see that this is something that's preventable. Absolutely. Uh, and so we got to have a space where this conversation can happen. And, and I just want to thank you, Mike, for listening. Yeah, for because sure. we need to understand what this term down low, where did sure. it come from? What's its origins? Is it something imposed on people or is it something that the, that the individuals uh, use that term themselves? Uh, the the um, exposure in the penal system and the criminal justice system. These are all issues that need to be out in the open and talked about. And so when it comes to uh, the fact that we have another infectious disease, COVID, uh, I just uh, wonder uh, what uh, are the impacts of COVID-19 
on, on people living with HIV AIDS? Do we know? I think I know for our clinic, and I just wanted to say to Mr. Brown that I really appreciate your vulnerability. We really have been trying to reach the heterosexual black male. Um, it's been, you know, in general, from our perspective, from my perspective, is that's a population that's hard to reach is because, you know, a lot of times, you know, with, even with my husband, it's hard to get him go, to go to the doctor. So it's one of those things that we're really trying to reach out and understand um, how to how to support, not just for HIV, for all health care, because, you know, black men matter to us. So we want to make sure that you're okay. Um, but in terms of COVID, um, we, what we found is my heart to hand, we really we were able to provide services throughout COVID, um, but we really in the beginning we needed to keep our people home because their immune systems are already low, right. and so we had to start using a lot of um, um, lifts to get them to their doctors, or we had to do home visits to get them um, their medication because they still needed to to be seen or or to be to talk to the doctor. We we were able to implement telehealth. So we were able to provide services that way to ensure that there was no um, treatment adherence issues or people didn't have access barriers to, to getting their medications. Um, but there was a lot of isolation, you know, okay. as we all experienced isolation. Um, it feels like people that we serve, they're becoming older and they live by themselves. So they already experienced isolation. So because we had support groups that were in person, they didn't get to see their friends, that they were able to just disclose and be, okay, you know, be very open. Um, we were able to um, have um, Zoom meetings for support groups okay. during COVID, um, but people really did have a hard time. Um, I'd like to also mention MPX or monkeypox. So then okay. there's monkeypox that came that that affected the HIV positive and the LGBT community as well. So anytime we're talking about people with potentially a compromised immune system, that includes, yes, the person who's got a kidney transplant, the person yeah. who's on chemotherapy, yes, and even the person who's HIV positive. Uh, uh, Dorothy Reynolds, and then uh, Andre, you're going to be up next. Let's bring Dorothy Reynolds up. And uh, Dorothy Reynolds from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Dorothy Reynolds, and I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I represent <clears throat> impressive styles and elite cuts beauty in barbershop well, and, well let me just say this i'm seeing you sporting the the university of maryland <laughs> wellness warrior shirt go ahead slip that yes. up <laughs> i love that out there in pine bluffs <laughs> well, so Dorothy. I I would, um actually people when i wear it out people ask me questions about it so it gives me an opportunity to tell them something <laughs> about what it stands for. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> one of my concerns was um, when we were shut down and not able to move around and people were at home or enclosed, I'll put it that way, did it have a lot of impact on the number of people that were exposed, male or female, and boys, boys, as well young boys so you're talking about uh, during the pandemic and being closed in and isolated did it cause a spike in hiv and in hiv and AIDS? yes okay sierra deidre do we know i have not noticed that i have not seen that in the trends actually for that year a lot of health departments maryland health department included always put out a caution because numbers drop for 2020 and 2021 there were um a lot of people were not able to or a lot of organizations were not able to be mobilized in order to do the amount of testing that they were doing previous to the pandemic so the numbers during COVID, when i say during COVID, i'm saying 2020 2021 are not reliable okay but picking back up again in 2022 i i don't notice the increase there's still a drop an overall drop. However, again, in the black community, that drop is not, um, the, the, it, it's still rising in certain black, specific black communities. And this is what as, should be a concern uh, for us all. Here's a disease totally preventable with good PrEP and PEP prophylaxis. And are people still getting infected? 
Yeah. And I, I, wanted to, I just wanted to jump in and quickly say too, is that um, people are not accessing test as you know as much as they possibly can we have self testing kits or we used to call them home at home testing kits during COVID, we we were offering to mail people test kits to their home and then doing a to do a zoom video with them to do the test that didn't people did not access those tests that much so i i am cautious and i do think that at some point we will see a rise as people are coming outside more um, we will see a rise. The other thing I would say, we talked about PrEP and PEP, but I also wanted to mention uh, undetectable means untransmittable, which means that a person who is HIV positive and they are uh, virally suppressed, they, based on the studies, they are not transmitting diseases to people who they're having sex, even with um, without a condom. Zero so percent. Say it again. Zero percent. Oh, oh yes, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So I think that's one of the things that that's one of the most important biomedical um, things that we've been able to that the scientists have been able to uh, provide for our community is that um, if you take your medicine and you're virally suppressed, um, you can have a relationship without a condom and you won't transmit disease to your partner. And I've seen it. I mean, I've had. Um, what we call um, discordant partners, where one person is HIV negative, one partner partner is HIV positive, they are having sex, and that HIV negative person has not gotten um, disease. And I also have had people that have had babies. You know, they have a pretty normal life if they're being adherent to treatment. And so I just want to make sure that we're putting all the information out because the Black community, we are still having a serious issue with stigma. And people still are not disclosing. I have people who have been HIV positive for over 20 years. They don't tell their family. So there's so many issues. But um, in terms of COVID, we're still holding our breath, I think, to see what impact it had on HIV. Very and good. Back in the 80s, when it started, the love, the one you with was a song and people <laughs> and, a, and a behavior. And I think that's what caused the HIV and AIDS to spread even more so. And one day I went in the salon and the, the music was up really loud. And I said, what is that? As after I listened to it, and it was Beyonce and I said, oh, well, that that's okay, but y'all need to turn it down a little bit. And then I heard what, what the music was saying, the words, the language, and I, I was just shocked because I just thought she was more classy than that. <laughs> But the song the was Cuff It. If you've not heard it, listen to it. Cuff They're It. Records. They sound and, records. and to me, that's spread of everything. <laughs> I mean, HIV and AIDS, anything that's communicable. Now, if you're at risk for HIV AIDS, uh, you're at risk for other sexually transmitted diseases. Absolutely. And I want Dr. Ritter to speak to that. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, speak to that, Dr. Ritter, as we bring up uh, uh, Andre, um, sure, let, sure. Let, me do, let me let me do this. I, I just saw Mike got a burning question. Yeah, I, I had a question. Well, <laughs> she kept saying virally suppressed. Can you elaborate that? Okay, that's good. That is that a dance? Yeah. That's not a dance, is it? <laughs> Viral suppression. What is it? Do you want to answer? Do you want me? So I I can. Well, Doctor Ritter. It, <laughs> so basically, okay. uh, they measure they measure your antibodies to the virus in your blood. So it's a number. It's actually, what is it? CD 20. CD4 count. CD4 I mean, count. Your, your your count. So they can yeah. measure how much virus is in your blood and the medication that you take reduces the amount of that number in your blood. Uh -huh. So when you get levels less than I think 200, 200 it's, yeah. it's undetectable and you, the, so the least amount of virus you have in your body, the less likely you will spread it. So they call it U equals U. Yep. Undetectable, untransmittable. U equals U if you stay on your meds. Reset. But you still have it. You still have absolutely. it, but it's not trans absolutely. zero transmitted because you're you're you don't have enough virus to spread it. Oh, wow. So 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 this is real important. You can see wow. light bulbs going off. Uh, because there are people living 
That's what I mean. We're living okay. with HIV, living. but not spreading it. But to some degree, After, that can be oh, stigma oh, too, right? Yes. Because you, you have to have the money and the resources That's to right. have the U equals U, right? And if That's you don't right. have U equal U, you're not. You gotta oh, have that Magic Johnson money. Exactly. <laughs> okay. that, now they're talking. Then money. you, then you did, right? Then you Can did. Can I just say something? Yeah. You don't really have to have yeah. money right. to have to be un to be um, violently suppressed. If you are, um, if you, there are programs we we provide treatment to almost everybody that walks in our in our space. If you have insurance, if you're un, undocumented, um, if you don't have insurance. We have grants, there um, are pharmaceutical programs, there's MADAP, which is Maryland AIDS Drug Assistance Program that provides you drugs. There are very, probably very oh, few, if any people in the state of Maryland in particular that should have HIV and want treatment and not be able to get it. Like if you walk in our doors, we are for the most part gonna be able to find you some way to, to provide that treatment for you. Yes, it is thousands of dollars to treat, but their programs. It, this is a public health issue. And we want to make sure that if you are out there and you think that you can't afford HIV treatment, that is not true. Heart to Hand, the Health Department, Jocks Initiative, there are many programs that can support and help you find that treatment that you need. And that's why this is so important to share that information in your shops. So this and is a preventable exactly. disease, but the problem why it's not it's not eliminated we haven't ended is because we haven't prevented the stigma right and that's why people don't get so it's right. preventable disease but we haven't prevented the stigma around that's it right. to go in and get tested and learn right. if you have it to not be shamed by it and uh, i can't believe how time's flying let, 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 get let me say this here. real quick before we go, run out go, of time go ahead and bring andrea bring yeah up. because you, you wait, gotta wait, keep wait, on andrea, talking wait. and all this is hold up you go ahead. Andre, Andre yes. Russell here from Atlanta <laughs> for the barbershop in the largest airport in the world. Hey, Andre. Not, not necessarily the largest airport, but however, it's the busiest airport in the world. And Thank you, what, Andre. What, what, we're, what, what we're running into is uh, I've been flying for a very long time. I'm probably a little bit older than most of you guys. And uh, Back when AIDS was something, they said, oh, uh, this was just something that uh, I, I had uh, an affair with a stewardess right before I went to so-and-so. And what we're looking at now and what I'm hearing is uh, people are treating AIDS uh, like, uh, oh, well, well, not, well, COVID, like uh, it's something that's going on uh, uh initially not not now 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 we know it's very very bad but initially covid was not something that we, we paid that much attention to because uh i can't get it because uh I, I i'm not there i didn't get it from bob i didn't get it from sally and what's happening now is uh like aids is is getting to the point where okay well i can get it i can get uh, I can get a shot where I'm no longer able to spread it to someone. And uh, I'm looking at my thing here and and uh, my internet connection is sort of sketchy right now. So I apologize for that. But uh, the point that I'm trying to make real quick is we need to concentrate more or, or and we are on uh COVID hasn't gone anywhere that's right uh, yeah it, it hasn't gone anywhere uh it's like AIDS. AIDS hasn't gone anywhere that's right However, what we have is uh with the people that have AIDS uh or HIV however you want to call it nowadays is it can be it can be pronounced as zero we can continue to have sex with every time I get on a plane I can have sex with somebody, and when I get into Houston, I can have sex with uh, everyone else. And I have also heard that people are saying that uh, 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 they people are having problems with whether or not they want to be a girl or a boy. That's really not that's really not the case right now. Uh, right now. Uh, people are saying that I was born a girl, I was born a boy, and then they have uh, 
uh, uh, people, doctors that they go to and say, uh, well, you know, uh, that is exactly the case and their parents are supporting this and it's going, uh, I consider it to be nuts. Uh, luckily, I have four sons and all of them are, want to be men. So, 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 so Andre, let me say, you, you helped us bring the HIV AIDS show onto the cutting edge. And oh, now yeah. you're going to help us bring another show onto the cutting edge, because as you can see, the group being stigmatized now politically weaponized uh, is the trans community uh, in ways I've me, never seen oh, before. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Dr. T. I love you, but bear with me one second. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be at the busiest airport in the world. Yes. I am trying to transport the, the information that I get from you guys from this particular panel and every panel that we do. Uh, I, I have very limited time to talk to any individual that comes to our shop, very limited. So uh, what we have, what we've developed is, uh, we've developed, and it's not, it's not a great section. It's a section where when these people are coming through Atlanta, uh, we have an information section that have a lot of flyers saying, this was happening in Atlanta. Be careful of this. Be careful of that. Uh, uh, do, 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 do you know anybody that has lupus? Uh, this is where you can go. If, you if As you go through Atlanta, you can stop here and pick up more information on lupus if you have lupus. Uh, and I'm taking classes at Emory where we have uh, whether or not we can look at somebody, someone and detect whether or not that they're having some types of dementia, uh, which dementia is not something that is happening right away where somebody said, well, you don't know that you have dementia. Uh, the people that they're associated with does not uh, know that they have dementia, but sometimes it can be recognized. If we have a customer that comes through uh, this week and last week he came through and said, oh, you have a barbershop? inside the airport so yeah you, you came through and got a cut last week oh really oh no i didn't realize that so this is these are small things they well do, do you have relatives here this is not something we can't determine whether or not they have dementia we don't know if he was drunk last time he came and he doesn't realize that he stopped by and got a haircut however what we're doing here is we are giving people information that's right uh to people that see people all the time, regularly. That's right, in your that, chairs, yes. That, that perhaps, perhaps we can give them a piece of information that goes somewhere uh, that I say, well, you know, when I lived there, I went to the airport, I was at the airport, and the guy said I was here last week and the week before. Uh, was I? And they can go and they see the doctor and say, I don't think I remember doing that. So, so that's Andre, now, Andre, now you've given us a third possible show when it comes to issues around dementia and the fact that our barbers and stylists are being trained. That's the other key for all of us to listen to. So let me do this, Andre. Because yes, I, I, number one, I can't believe it's uh, 818. Uh, uh, and so, we first of all, let me thank you. I, we got to get a public health. We got to get a public health minute in here, Andre. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. But thank you. Let's snap, Andre. This was his theme. Now he's given us three more topics to work on, <laughs> and I want Deidre, uh, Sierra, and Dr. Ritter to recognize how important it is that we have a space where people can share what they know, uh, share the gaps, uh, the knowledge gaps, and how we can provide some wisdom. For how to yeah. translate that information into people sitting in their chair. And Deidre and, and, and Sierra, drop some flyers. The next time you pass through Atlanta, drop some flyers because I am I'm very far away from Maryland and I feel very bad that you guys are concentrating everything to the people in Maryland, but I love you still. Okay, no, Dr. Right. T. Go. Andre, trust me, we're gonna get you together. We, <laughs> we are we are a point of contact for the nation. Uh, Meg, Meg, give us our public health camera, minute. Andre. Okay, so um, 
So just just building off of that, I mean, yeah, we need to get you HIV information. I was listening to you, Andre, and two things before I do the public health minute. So one, we do have to get you HIV information because you would not believe how much um, sex trafficking happens in airports. Yep. Um, and the fact that people travel to go to sex parties. This is something that um, I, I was trained in St. Louis, um, the gonorrhea and syphilis capital of America, where people do come to St. Louis specifically to have sex parties. And so when we are talking about these issues, we need to talk about travel, right? Because um, as much as we don't talk about sex, it allows these things to kind of go under the underground where people don't even know that's happening, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, everybody strap in for this public health minute I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, Buckle your seat belts, people. Yeah, Mary Neal's not here and we're taking advantage. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say off of what you said, Andre, is um, we can definitely go into it more. Um, but you started to talk about trans people, right? And this is another thing that people don't talk about um, that isn't, it, that's actually older than HIV um, because it's it's thousands of years old. You know, we have newspapers actually that um, from the 1880s, I remember hearing it was like, you know, people being shocked that there are these people in their community that are that are men that want to be women or women who want to be men. And, you know, it was this newspaper article that said, I find it shocking that you find it shocking. In the 1880s, it was like, this is very common where I live, you know, and, and it told this story. Um, so, like I say, we can go into it more because this is just a community that's hidden. It's just hidden. It, it's it's around, um, but um, that's another show. And so Meg sure. has prepared for for us a public health minute. We do this uh, routinely, uh, where she drops some nuggets of knowledge and uh, information that the barbers and stylists can actually use. Uh, Meg, take it away. I am so excited. So what I want, this is like the Narcan training, everybody. So I'm going to train you so that you can train other people because I think, and I thought about this, I was like, what do I want to do? I think that we do not talk about how to use, we don't talk about sex period. We don't talk about how to use condoms. I love one of the very first things. Sierra, you act like you know what's things. coming. <laughs> <laughs> we have to keep an eye on her. That's just, oh, it's a very keep an eye on her. I'm sorry. Um, is how to use condoms. It seems very basic, but where I grew up, it was legal to lie about sexual education at school. So I suspect that not a lot of people have learned how, to, how correctly to use and store condoms. So condoms, the first thing I want you to know is that they expire. Um, they are not infinite use. You can't buy them and use them 10 years later. There's actually an expiration date on the back. These are six years expired. So that's why they get to be used for demos now. These cannot be kept in cars. They cannot be kept in wallets. They cannot be kept where they are going to get damaged at all. They need to be kept nicely. They need to be kept nicer than you keep anything else. Okay, because these can get damaged and when they're damaged, they're useless. So don't keep them in your glove right. box. You don't put them in a ziplock. You need something hard. You need something hard to keep them in because if these get crushed, they can get pin pricked. They can get I mean, these need, they're pressure sensitive. If you're embarrassed to be carrying these things around, I get that. You know what I recommend? Buy bubble tape, get rid of the gum, and you got a hard container that fits three or four. It's pink. So <laughs> get bubble tape. So you will a hard container, fits in your pocket, fits in your purse. So you have it and you're good to go, right? So what do you do? Um, this can be done before you leave, and you should do this before you before you leave the house or before you use them, wherever you use them. Um, these need to have an air pocket. These are airtight, and they shouldn't feel flat. You should be able to, they should have a bubble in them. Um, so that's the first thing to check. If it doesn't have a bubble, it's not usable. Pillowy, just a little bit. Throw it out, get another one. So the other thing to check, yeah, is the expiration date. If it's expired, throw it out, get another one. Okay. So it's good to go. First thing you do is you hold it in your hands and you pull the condom to the side. You pinch it and pull it. Why? Because you can rip these things in half if you don't do that. You can accidentally tear it and then you can't use it. Right, so you pinch and pull, then you tear it open. 
Okay, so they're rolled, right? Tend to be a little bit slimy, just warning you. So they're rolled and there's two sides you could go up, right? So it's very important that the way it's up looks like a party hat. So it rolls down, right? Because if you flip it the wrong way, it won't roll down. And when you go to flip it the right way, inside out, um, if you've already started to put it on, you can already way. have fluids. If you've already started to put it on and it's backwards, you've got fluids on the inside. And then you're going to flip it inside out and it's going to touch that other person. So the whole point of using a barrier layer to prevent all the infections, to prevent everything, can be negated when you put it on backwards. So if you accidentally put it on backwards, throw it out, start over, right? And then you can roll all the way down. When you put it on, you have to, you can't put it flush to the top, right? You gotta leave space because this is a fact that shocks everybody. Um, when the semen can rip these. What? They can rip it. The little so, spirochetes can rip it. Yes. <laughs> if it is, if it is tight like a drum. Okay. That person's gonna rip right through. And then what was the point? Okay. So they say pinch an inch, right? Because you always want just a little bit extra. So uh, the word is spermatozoa. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. T. Mm -hmm. So, and then when you're done, you pull off, you knot it, and you don't ever use it again. You don't wash it. You don't do anything else with it. It's garbage. So you and don't... no hot sauce. No hot sauce. It's no. illegal. Yes, people were putting hot sauce because of the whole Drake thing. It's illegal. It's a booby trap. Booby traps are illegal. Don't put hot sauce in your condo. Sorry, I had to add that. Hot sauce. I never heard that in my life. And oh. man, and man, you might want to make sure you throw it away and you keep it because women might do interesting things with their sperm in the condom. Put tissue in the condom, but don't flush it down the toilet. Put tissue oh in the God. condom so that it absorbs. Wrap it up and then throw it in the trash. So women can't use the sperm that's yeah. in the condom. And you guys wanted to turn my mic off? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> I have two more myths. One, you can use two. Sixty-five, and some of this stuff is new to me. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do this demo as many times as you want, you guys. Um, and so, two things. One, you can use two. That was something that has been corrected. Um, double bagging is fine. I was told initially it causes too much friction. You're actually good. Um, two, you need to use the correct lube. To that point, hot yeah. sauce is not lube. Right. Um, and you do need to use the correct lube because if you use one, um, if you do not use one that is water-based, it will start chemically dissolving the condom and then it doesn't work. So there's a lot, it's a lot of prep work, a little bit of prep work for a lot of reward. So just. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Can I just quickly also say that um, you want to make sure that you're not allergic to the um, latex and you want to and also lambskin you don't want to use lambskin because it's porous and um fluid seeps through okay yes. wow this is really just a beginning uh not an <laughs> end and so what Sorry, i want to I do uh what i want to do meg is is bring up the word yeah. cloud as we okay. get ready to head to the finish line i can't believe how fast this evening has gone and Can katrina, we take get on deck, katrina you get ready uh, Sorry, one final thing. Um, yeah. I have to do this for, for equity. So um, you're supposed to use these when you give oral for women or people who have vaginas, yeah? But most people don't oh carry around dental dams. Yeah. So what you do, you take a regular condom and you cut it down the middle. And then you have a sheet. Okay. Right? Because when you give oral, that's what you're supposed to do. Thank you, you for that. Down. Look, thank you for okay, that. Let's snap this public yeah. health minute. This is the first. Uh, Meg, what the yeah. hell school did you go to? <laughs> school did not teach me this. Um, bring it, bring up that word, say, Can I say one thing? Condoms yeah. are expensive, but Heart to Hand provides free condoms and free dental dams. Awesome. Yeah, uh, those are, yeah. Let's get Katrina up. What do they call it? Dental what? 
Dental Dam. Dam. Dental Dam. Dental Dam. D A M. Yep. D A M. So, so, so take a look here. Uh, and Sierra and Deidre, uh, Dr. Ritter knows this. Every uh, evening we put up a word cloud. I'm going back to school. And as you can see here, uh, informed, uh, the larger the word, the more people who said that word, a uh, hopeful, confused, cautious, uh, inspired, challenged. There's still trepidation out there. Some people still mad, pissed. Uh, this is an international issue. When we say pandemic, I mean, it's global. HIV, AIDS was global. As anywhere it is in the world, it can come and get us. The same thing with COVID. Irritated, concerned, blessed, thankful. Uh, this is an amazing word cloud. And I want my panelists to think about this as we get ready to give you uh, the final word as we close out tonight's show. Uh, let's start with uh, 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 Sierra Carey Brown. Uh, oh. your, clo your closing comments, your take home message from the show tonight. My take home comment, my take home comment, my take home comment <laughs> is that, um, let me just say, let me just say, uh, to okay. the audience, we'll, we'll go over just uh, two or three minutes. Believe it or not, I can't believe the time has flown. <laughs> Sierra, you're on. Close this out. Um, I will say that. <sighs> Go girl. It, it, it's so much. It's so much. Just one thing to say is we all share responsibility. I will say we all share responsibility for ourselves and our behaviors. Um, we share responsibility, believe it or not, if you want to or not, we still share responsibility for our community members, our neighbors, our brothers, sisters, those who are blood related and those who are not blood related. We all had to look out and care for one another. And this is not HIV specific, but this is just something that's on my mind and on my heart right now. Well, thank um, you. Thank you yes. for sharing that. Dr. Dr. Ritter, what's your, your closing observation, your closing comment? So, yeah, so thank you. I, um, the point that Sierra made about so, um, sexual pleasure as a social determinant of health really struck with me because we, fall in love and we should be able to have pleasurable sex healthy sex is healthy living and the social determinants of health around this are stigma so um i like that i'm going to work with that more i never looked at my field that way before so thank you very much for that thank you dr ritter hey deirdre spears you're uh uh, you're going to give us the last word as our panelists here on the cutting edge. Knowledge is power um, and be responsible for the energy you bring in the room, um, in the barbershop, in the church, at your house. Um, just understand that we're all going through something and, um, you know, someone who's living with HIV or whatever they're going through, um, it's hard. Like it's it's difficult and just be responsible for the energy you bring in the room. You might be saving someone's life. You might be connecting them to some service that they need. Um, just just be responsible and um, aware that you can make a difference. Well, I, I can't thank uh, your panelists enough. Uh, uh, Katrina, we'll, we'll get back to you. This is an ongoing conversation because I definitely want to know what's happening in your chair. <laughs> yes, this was a very interesting conversation. I loved it. Indeed, and 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 I want to channel uh, the mayor here, Mayor Omar Neal, who always closes us with a quote, uh, and I'm going to use this one from the mayor, as you could hear in that conversation, as people were learning and people trying to learn the language and trying to get it right so that we can open up a conversation rather than close it down. We all are possessors of some truth, but it's only when we bring our truths together do we ultimately get to the truth. That's what the cutting edge is all about. And so until next time on the cutting edge, be safe, harm reduction, and spread the knowledge. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. I'll leave you with these two. This is words. wonderful. We just this one around. I'll leave you with the perfect love. But more importantly, remember this.